to that. <laughs> that was preaching. In fact, it, it's not only tough. Uh, my buddy Bob over there, before uh, we sang today, he said, I'm so excited to hear you preach today, Rick, because... Uh, I heard the same chapter preached from Dr. David Jeremiah. I thought, well, if that isn't pressure, I don't know what it is. But he said, you're going to do great, Rick. Uh, but I love that. But anyway, Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to begin reading at verse uh, 18. In just a moment, we're finishing our study in Ephesians. Um, as you're turning there, uh, I've been blessed over the years to have a handful of experiences on short-term mission trips. Some of you have been on a number of these. Some of you have had the shared experiences with me on various trips. And what a blessing they are because when you carry the gospel and you minister in a foreign country or another part of the United States, it really makes the world seem to be a much smaller place. And there are so many great experiences on a foreign mission trip. Speaking slowly so that your interpreter has time to communicate. It actually, uh, if you preach a 30 minute message, you better make it a 15 minute message because they're gonna have to interpret. Enjoying and not enjoying different cuisine. Uh, I am not a curry chicken or anything curry type of fan. Some of you are, I'm not, but there's so many international foods that I've enjoyed. I enjoy on these foreign mission trips living a simpler, less constraining life. In fact, many places uh, we have ministered and some uh, along with me, uh, the watch is not demanding everything. People seem to enjoy things on a slower pace seeing parts of the world you might not ever see again, and then appreciating things that are unique to every foreign mission experience. I had the blessing, for instance, of performing a baptism in the Indian Ocean. Uh, Griff Aldrich, I was able to, to baptize him uh, there. I wrapped a boa constrictor around my neck in South America. It was, a, I thought, a pet of a local missionary kid. After I put it around my neck, he informed me he had found it in the wild about five days earlier. <laughs> so he may not have even known when its last meal was. So uh, that was a terrible mistake. Straddling the equator. Danny was sharing that in his testimony, uh, how a Buckingham boy for him, or, or Charlotte County, Buckingham, me, Appomattox, Buckingham, to actually be able to straddle the equator, who would think of that? I've had the blessing, I guess you would say, of saying that I flew over the most shark-infested area in the world off the coast of East Africa, and they told us that before they put us on this little prop plane that carried just a handful of people. Randy and I up there, uh, as well as others, enjoyed eating at Toro Loco in Brazil, a real Brazilian steakhouse. I've learned so many things. I've learned there's no way you can get up before Mike Johnson. I've tried it. <laughs> I'm thinking I'm getting up early at 6 o'clock. I see Alan back here nodding his head because you've been with him up in Vermont, but he's usually on about his third cup of coffee when I think I'm getting up uh, early. But you know, far and away, the best experience of my foreign mission trips has been being able to meet believers around the world. I think of the missionaries that I've known, like Fred Sorrells, who at that time was in Africa and now works for Special Olympics as a believer and around the world. I think of Tubby and Tommy Pickering, who were in South America at that time, I believe in Florida now, but the blessing of working with them and riding around, as we said the other night in Lottie, Lottie Moon paid for the vehicle that uh, we rode around in. I have fond memories, along with John uh, Parker of Sugnan Venkat, Pastor Samuel, Pastor Johan, friends that we made. We've eaten in the homes of nationals. We've slept 
in their homes. John and I stayed in a home that had uh, no uh, windows in the house and there was a dog outside that was barking. John fell asleep just like that. It took me a little time. But it's been a blessing firsthand to witness that there are believers around the world. Like even right now, Many Christians are coming and moving toward the close of the Lord's day, having served the Lord in that day. Some of them have traveled uh, 50, 100 miles maybe, even to come together. And it's just a beautiful thing to, to realize that God is so big and that things are happening around the world. But one of the saddest experiences of the foreign mission trip is when you leave an area and you realize that unless something unusual happens, these people you've grown to respect and love, you realize that you may never see them again this side of eternity. You know, as I think about the Apostle Paul, he was a missionary, and he traveled on lots of short-term missions. Now, his experience in Ephesus was much more than short-term. He was there about two years. But imagine the relationships that he developed during the two years of time. He met countless individuals who shared love for Christ. And, and you know, as we think about all the churches, and there were a number of churches that he either established or helped facilitate the growth, maybe none was more dear to him than Ephesus. Not that he played favorites, but we know he was so close to Ephesus that when he was returning to Jerusalem, what he thought at that time might be his imminent death, that a number of believers traveled a great distance from Ephesus to send their greetings to him. And it was, wasn't a short trip. And so as we've been studying this, these weeks, now we come to the close of Ephesians. We're looking at chapter 6, and, and it should really excite us as we're building up. He's been talking about spiritual warfare, and the question is, how is Paul going to close this great letter? You know, what are going to be his last words to the church there? And that's where we come today in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. These people who endeared themselves to him, who he shared ministry with, he speaks to them. And he says in Ephesians 6, 18, pray at all times in the spirit with every prayer and request and stay alert with all perseverance and intercession for all the saints. Pray also for me that the message may, may be given to me when I open my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. For this I am an ambassador in chains. I pray that I might be bold enough to speak about it as I should. Tychicus, our dearly loved brother and faithful servant in the Lord, will tell you all the news about me so that you may be informed. I'm sending him to you for this very reason, to let you know that we are, how we are and to encourage your hearts. Peace to the brothers and sisters in love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who have undying love for our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we close this multi-week study in the book of Ephesians, we thank you for the things that we have already studied. We thank you for learning about the responsibilities in the Christian home, the preparation that must be made for spiritual warfare, the fact, Lord, that indeed we are saved by grace through faith, not of our own doing, and, and that we understand that we are created as your workmanship to bring glory to you. Father, as we close this study, and Paul begins, or ends it rather, by speaking on the subject of prayer, I pray that uh, you would indelibly impress upon us the importance of prayer. Lord, intercessory prayer, prayer of supplication, prayers on behalf of others. And so, Lord, we lift this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. 
You know, this has been a, a fun journey for me, to be honest. There were a number of other books in the New Testament that I was led to a, a lot sooner than this. And one of the reasons uh, was that I wanted uh, really to go through this book with the church during a time where we would have an extended time to go through it. And we've done that. And Paul has given instructions. He's given in challenges to us. And now he closes with really a final charge. And we're going to look at that in a moment. But before we look at that, I want to draw to your attention in verse 21, where he mentions an individual. This individual is Tychicus. We do not know much about Tychicus. In fact, uh, very little is mentioned. He is mentioned in about three or four other places in Scripture. Uh, but we do know that what is said of him is consistent. For instance, what is said of him here is consistent also in Paul's epistle to the Colossians, and it was this. He was a dearly loved brother and a faithful servant in the Lord. So what do we know about Tychicus here? First, we know that he was intricately involved in the fellowship of the local church. And not only was he involved with the church, but he actually had a distinct ministry in the church. He gave of his time, he gave of his talents to the church. He was what we might call a good church member. And one of the primary tasks that he had was that of being a messenger. A messenger from the missionary Paul to the church, wherever that church might be, and vice versa. And he was a messenger not just to Ephesus. As I mentioned a moment ago, the same thing is said in the book of Colossians. He served the same purpose with Paul to the churches there. To Titus while he was in Crete. To Timothy who later was in Ephesus and how again Tychicus carried out the needs. And so uh, this man Tychicus had a, a special mem uh, ministry in the church and it was that of easing the concerns of the church. It was that of giving updates, of saying, yeah, Paul is doing well. This is what he's doing. He, he's in this situation. He, he's incarcerated now, but he's doing okay. And he was able to carry that message. When we go through the list of New Testament saints, his name is probably not going to be at the forefront, but I believe he's representative of those in the church who without seeking acclaim, just carry out the duties that God has given to them. And such ones make a great difference in the kingdom. So much that this individual was mentioned a number of times by Paul. His ministry was greatly valued. Well, as we look at Tychicus in this special place that he had in the ministry to the churches, Paul follows that really uh, with a closing in verses 23 and 24 that would be normative for him. He was extending peace, extending grace and love to the church there. He speaks about the confidence of the Ephesians who had a security in their salvation and undying love for Christ. But directly before addressing Tychicus and his uh, closing words to the church there, Paul focuses on a final plea, a final charge, a final command, and it was this, pray. He said to the church, pray. You know, many times in the church we think that prayer precedes action. For instance, we're going out in the community this Wednesday, and we would say we're going to pray and prepare to go out on Wednesday. No, prayer is part of the ministry. When we pray in faith, we're especially in the, in the ministry of intercession or supplication, it is an active word. You may lack gifting in a certain area, but we're not to lack prayer. In fact, uh, we're not to do anything minus prayer. Some of us may be lacking, but every one of us can pray. And Paul calls the church here in the very last words, after he talks about instructions for the home, after he talks about equipping for spiritual warfare, he closes by asking for a general prayer, but also he asks that they specifically pray for him. So I want to look at three aspects of the prayer today uh, that Paul is petitioning the church to carry out. And the first is this, when we are to pray. When are we to pray? 
Well, we see that in verse 18. Pray at all times, in every situation. This brings to mind the same instruction of a more familiar verse that says really the same thing, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, that we're to pray without ceasing. We're to be in a constant state of prayer. Now, obviously, the context of it, much as the song that Marin just sang, uh, speaks of God being there, of God's protection in the midst of conflict, God's deliverance. And so as he's speaking about prayer here, really his instructions about spiritual warfare really dovetails right into prayer. And so we would say contextually here, he's probably speaking about the intercessory prayer for their protection, for the saints' protection in spiritual warfare, and even for Paul himself. But I want to note, while there are many times that we can pray, I want to take just a, a brief time, and this is not an exhaustive list, but just a representative list of when we can pray. We can pray when we're in difficulty. We're going through a time of crisis, a health crisis, a personal crisis, a relational crisis, a professional crisis. We can pray in difficulty. Uh, a few months ago, we went through study of the Old Testament kings and what a testimony it is to the power of God. I had mentioned, uh, I believe, Hezekiah, how he laid out his request before God when Sennacherib had threatened him. But I also mentioned, I believe, a couple of weeks ago, another favorite Old Testament king, Jehoshaphat. He was the one that just led basically a choir. Remember, they sang and the army turned against itself. But, but, but sort of the uh, prequel to that was there were a number of groups in and around uh, Judah that had set themselves, uh, themselves against Jehoshaphat and the people. They were threatening. And, and Jehoshaphat looked around. He felt the responsibility for the people, and he was greatly disturbed. And in 2 Chronicles 20 and verse 12, we read the king's words, a prayer. He says, Our God, will you not judge them? For we are powerless before this vast number that comes to fight against us. We do not know what to do, but we look to you. What did Jehoshaphat do? He looked around, he said, there's nothing that I can do about this God, but he laid it out before God. And you know what God did? He turned the enemy against itself. He prayed and God worked. What about praying in times of temptation? Jesus in his model prayer said, lead us not into temptation, but when we find ourselves confronted with evil, he follows by saying, and deliver us from evil. 1 Corinthians uh, 10 and verse 13 says uh, that there's no temptation that comes upon us except as is common toward other people. And God is faithful and will provide a way of escape. But in order for us to take that escape, we must be in communion with God, in touch with God, praying with God for delivery. And so we can pray in times of temptation? Are you the type of person that just walks right into temptation mindlessly? Or do you see it for what it is, seeking God's strength to resist it? We can pray when wisdom is needed, when we need wisdom. When Solomon was named king, God was pleased with Solomon. He promised him the world, basically a blank check in for those of you younger than 25 years old, there used to be a thing called a check that you would have, all right? But basically, he said, I'll give you anything. And Solomon asked for wisdom. And God was pleased, and he gave him wisdom, and he gave him even more than that. James 1, 5 through 8 says that any of us, if any of us lacks wisdom, let that one ask of God who gives to all people generously and without reproach. Have you ever thought about that prayer? How many times do we go through a time where maybe we have a decision number A or letter A, decision letter B, and we have to decide what are we going to do? And, and we just think, well, I'll just figure it out myself. Do you stop and pray for wisdom? God, give me wisdom how to handle this situation. Give me wisdom. What do I need to do in this situation? I wonder today, are you in a time of decision in your life? 
Paul says pray at all times, and most certainly that means pray when you need wisdom. But then a fourth thing, and again, this isn't an exhaustive list, it's a representative list. Pray after successes. Pray after successes. You know, for athletic teams, one of the most dangerous times, you know where I'm going, is after a great success and you've got something coming up in a couple of days because you immediately begin to be overconfident. You rest on your laurels and you begin to think back. And success can be a very damaging thing even in the Christian life. I shared a, a, a while back, a number of years ago, Pastor Willie was preaching. It was a convention, a, a number of churches that were together over at Evergreen. And I was on the platform with like six or eight ministers and Pastor Willie preached in the middle of the group. It was, it was a situation where a number of ministers would, would preach and he nailed it. I mean, he preached a powerful message. And as he walked by the platform, I was thinking, man, he did great. And the first thing he said was, Rick, pray for me. He said it under his breath. That was a voice of experience, a man at that time who was in his 70s for a number of years who realized that when something happened great, that when God used him, he needed his head on a swivel. He needed prayer. Think about Elijah. He stood on Mount Carmel and stood down against 450 prophets of Baal. And then all it took was one woman, Jezebel, to run him out of the city. And, and, and why was that? I believe in part because he wasn't prayed up after a success. He, he let his guard down. He did not return back to the fundamentals of prayer. These are just a few times of prayer. But, but Paul says pray at all times. Do you pray for your children, your grandchildren? Do you pray for your boss? If you have people working under you, do you pray for those who work under you? We're to be instruments of prayer. But then we see how we are to pray. Paul doesn't just tell us when to pray, to pray at all times. But he tells us how to pray. And again, he himself doesn't give an exhaustive list of directions in prayer, but he does give us three distinct ways that we're to pray, how we're to pray. First is in the Spirit. We're to pray in the Spirit. Notice what he says, pray at all times in the Spirit. The Spirit is the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is the one who empowers our prayer and prompts our prayer. He gives power and he gives prompting early in the book of Acts, and early in the life of the church, God told the disciples to wait. They had to wait for 10 days. They waited for the gift, the promise. The promise was a person, the Holy Spirit. He was given to the disciples. Now you think, why wait? I mean, I'm an impulsive person. I know what happened to Jesus. I know he lived a perfect life. If I were the disciple, I would have thought this way. I know that he died. I know that he raised. I have the message. Let me have at it. But they were told to wait. Why? Because they needed the power and the prompting of the Holy Spirit. It comes through obedience to Christ. You see, we may set out on something in a day and God may have something else that he directs toward us. I don't know how many times in my life I've had a plan. Somebody maybe has intercepted that plan and I've looked at it as an inconvenience, but maybe that was the plan God had for me. And when we're in touch with the Holy Spirit, we follow his prompting and how he leads us into prayer, how he leads us into ministry. And then most certainly he empowers us. In fact, just a few verses after Acts 1, 4, it says you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the other most parts of the earth. But it's not just that he empowers. I can't emphasize enough. The Holy Spirit also directs our prayers. Paul said in Romans 8, 27, that we don't even, even when we don't know what to pray, the Spirit within us through groanings and unctions prays. 
And then I like what it says in 1 Corinthians 2, 11, talking about how the Spirit knows the things of God and the desires of God. Do you want to know if you're praying in the will of God and you're praying what God would have you to pray? 1 Corinthians 2, 11 says, who knows a person's thought other than that own person's spirit? You see, I may do something and you may be thinking, he's thinking this, but in my spirit, I'm thinking something else. Who knows other than a person's spirit? Well, the same thing is true of God. Who knows the things of God other than the spirit of God? And so we're to pray in the spirit. We're also to pray with every prayer and request. That word prayer that's listed there in verse 18 is a general word for prayer. Request specifically mentions petitions. I like how Curtis Vaughn, who I knew in Fort Worth, Texas, when I was at Southwestern, how he commented on this. He said, Paul uses both of these words not necessarily as a distinction, but more as an emphasis. To say this and this, he's sort of driving home the importance that we need to pray with supplication. We need to pray uh, petitionary prayers. But then we see also we're to pray within a, with perseverance, rather, and intercession. Notice what it says, with all perseverance and intercession for all the saints. In Luke chapter 18, we read a parable that tells us that we should always pray and not give up. It's a parable of a persistent widow. She was a widow, and she had a great need. She needed justice against her adversary. She went and, and knocked on the judge's door, he didn't care about God. He didn't care about her. He had no time for her, but she kept knocking. She kept knocking. And finally, he granted the request, not because he wanted to do the right thing, that he cared about what was right in God's eyes, not because he cared about that woman to grant her. He basically said, I'm answering this, so you'll quit bothering me. But then Jesus follows using an a fortiori argument, a lesser to the greater. He says, if this judge who had evil motives, didn't care about anything, answered the prayer of someone or the request of someone who continued to petition, how much more will your father who loves to give good gifts give them? You say, well, why didn't he give them to me like that? Because he knows our nature. <laughs> If he gave us everything and like that, then we would miss the process of the blessing of persevering in prayer. Are you praying for something? Keep praying. Pray in faith. Realize God is working in the process. I wonder how many things are not accomplished because God's people stop short of persevering. So we see how we're to, how we're to pray in the spirit with request and in emphasizing that, that we need to be praying uh, continually and, and praying in perseverance. But for whom are we to pray? Paul answers that also. He focuses on that aspect of prayer that is intercession. You see, I can, I can have a petition for myself, like, give me this. Or I can have a prayer from Mike. I can say, Lord, give him that. And so the, the aspect of petitionary prayer, uh, Paul is saying to the church, they're not in this case that they pray for themselves. There was a place and time for that. But here he is saying, intercede on behalf of others. There's a poster in the back, and I actually had it, it laminated. It, it, it's on the bulletin board in the back because it spoke to me. And it says this, the things we pray for reveal a lot about our hearts. So let's focus our hearts and our prayers on others. How many times do we go with our own needs? But Paul is saying here to the church, pray for others. And he gives them two charges. Pray for the saints. Pray for all of the saints. This is not a select group of super righteous Christians. Saints are believers. That's, that's equated with being a believer. When a person trusts Jesus Christ, they are made righteous. They are saints. They become saints. And so he's saying, pray for the church. 
Do you pray for this church? Do you pray for fellow believers? Do you have lists? Do you pray for your fellow Sunday school members by name? Do you pray for other churches here? One of the blessings that some of us as pastors have in this area is we'll text each other on Sunday mornings praying for you. Jeff and I do that sometimes and others that, that we can intercede on behalf of other churches, missionaries, that we can be in prayer, interceding, praying for all of the saints. It's a ministry we're called to do. And then Paul says, verse 19, pray also for me. You say, well, what is Paul doing here? Is he self-centered in this? No, Paul was looking at much bigger. He realized that he was going to be the target of Satan. He already was. He'd been in prison for his faith. He needed strength. And so he's saying, pray for me. He mentions that he is an ambassador. In other words, the voice. He was the voice of God. He was representing God to others. And so we don't have people like Paul today. There are no contemporary apostles in the term as it's used in the New Testament. Those were ones who visibly had seen Christ. Even Paul himself saw Christ on the road to Damascus and was called toward that. But we do have people who speak the word of God, who speak not of themselves, but preach the word. Preachers today who do that, I being one. And so as we look at applying it today, as Paul is saying to the church, pray for me, we would say that we would pray for ministers, for missionaries who are speaking God's word. A few weeks ago I shared, I been, was reading a book by E.E. E. Shellhammer, and uh, it was a book on Finney. And, and it was basically called Finney on Revival. And he took excerpts from from Charles G. Finney, but Shellhammer himself at the close of the book listed five, and he himself was a preacher, five things every preacher needs. And so I copied it, pasted it on my little book. The first is purity, purity and motives, doing the right thing for the right reason. Second is humility, being able to be teachable, being able to look at oneself honestly, Humility. Second is charity, demonstrating love, not looking at people as things to do or to move up, but actually demonstrating love. The fourth is chastity, having a pure life sexually, morally, chastity. And I thought the fifth y'all would love, brevity. <laughs> that he would be brief. That he'd be brief. You're probably saying... Rick, I wish you would have applied that right now. I'm ready to go home and eat. But he prayed for brevity, and I thought about that. That seemed the least spiritual thing. But then he qualified it in the book. He said that I will do what God has called me to do, not add to it, embellish it in any way, and I would trust God in it. And so as we look at Paul here, he's saying, pray for me, and, and there's so many areas. You could pray for his personal life. You could pray for endurance for him. But he's praying specifically about the oratorical aspect of what he did, about his speaking, about his preaching. And so he's saying, pray that the message may be given to me is the first thing. In other words, that he wouldn't just be up there blowing air, but he would speak the word of God. Sometimes people encourage me. And they say, preacher, I was encouraged by that sermon. And I immediately get taken aback. And I know what they mean, and maybe it's just an issue of semantics. But I had a good friend in seminary that would drive home, Rick, we don't preach sermons, we preach messages. Sermons are discourses that anybody, a message is that you're taking a message God is giving and you're relaying it. And that's Paul's spirit here. God, give me a message Give me the words that I might speak. And so as an ambassador, he's saying, I want to carry the message that God has to the people. Pray that God will continue to give me the message. One of the most difficult things in the ministry is that transition between series of messages. 
you've preached in Ephesians and you go and you say, okay, God, I know you led me to that, but where would we go next? And if we're not careful, many times as preachers, we can go where we're comfortable or we can go where we think we may need to go. Paul realized that in the spiritual warfare he was in, he needed to speak the very words of God. But he also prayed, not just that the word would be given, but that he would open his mouth boldly. Boldly. When I was young, I've shared, um, I've always loved basketball all my life. I, I still love watching the games. Um, and, uh, but I didn't play baseball. My granddad was a big baseball guy. I've got on a tie pin that he, that he had. And I realized why I didn't play baseball. When I was in Little League, one time I played in a game, I went to bat twice, I got hit by the ball three times. And you figure, how does that happen? The pitcher turned and threw the ball and hit me at second base where you don't want to be hit. And uh, so when I was batting, guess what I was doing? I was ready to bail out. Well, if you're starting to bail out, you've got no punch. I couldn't hardly get the ball by the pitcher. I said, well, I'm done with baseball. I didn't have confidence. I didn't have boldness when I stepped in there. Paul was being attacked, but what he said, let me stand at that plate. Let me be anchored. Let that anchor leg not move. Allow me to be strong in this. His desire was not just that he preached confidently and without fear, but without compromise in God's power. Listen, God's word is here, and the world is all around the place. God's word is unchanging. Culture is always changing. Paul is saying, God, may you give me the word, and when you give it to me, let me confidently speak it for your glory. And so as Paul is closing this letter, he's basically saying, church, pray for the saints and pray for me as I go out from you to other places that God would continue to speak to me so that he might speak through me and that I would speak boldly. Well, as we close the study, I think we've seen God's heart in all of this. The first three chapters, the love that he has for us, that by grace we save through faith, not that of ourselves, it is a gift of God. And then right after that, understanding that we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, the works resulting from God's working in and through us. We've found that God has a plan for our marriage, a structure in the home, that God has uh, given us information how to handle spiritual warfare, that, that warfare that is very real, that may not be seen uh, in, in the physical eye. And then he closes it all by saying, pray. Pray. Pray for your fellow believers. Pray for your family. It would be understand, understood. Pray for those who preach the word, who are the voice of God in assemblies like this, that they would remain true, that they would hear the word of God and stay anchored in it, unmoving with boldness. Let's pray. Father, as we uh, have looked at this series of messages, we thank you for this wonderful book in the New Testament. We thank you, Lord, for your love for us. And we thank you, God, for your call on our lives. And Lord, today specifically, that call is to pray. And Father, we must develop the discipline of prayer, setting aside time uninterrupted to pray, seeking wisdom, seeking protection, interceding for family members, for coworkers, for the church here, for missionaries. And Father, most certainly praying for those who communicate your word week in and week out. Father, we pray that if there be any here today who have yet to trust Christ, that today would be that day, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.